Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lulu. Lulu. What up? Uh, very little in the announcement way today, and then we're going to get right into the stories. People love that. People do love that. So I'll just say real quick, brand new uh, to the Bad Magic merch store, a cool redacted tee and zip up hoodie. A uh, cool retro typewriter style text design with large hand-drawn redaction marks. Uh, it's cool to imagine Scared to Death being redacted in some blacklist government paranormal or alien program as being a source of study or psyop. What if, what if I'm the government agent? You are. I am? Yep, you just don't even know it. That's how deep it is. Oh, I don't even know that I'm a conduit for, for alien soft disclosure. Uh, new redacted tea and zip hoodie available at badmagicmerch.com. Get a little X-Files. And then uh, you had a charity reminder, and then we're off and running. I sure do, friend. All right. Well, as a reminder, this month's charity donation is for $14,740. Headed over to Teach for America, a diverse network of leaders who work to confront the injustice of education inequity through teaching. You can learn more about Teach for America or get involved by going to teachforamerica.org. And then just as a note, an additional $1,640 is being put towards the scholarship fund for next year. Awesome. We, we built up this year. Now we're building up next year's. Yay, 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 yay. Yay, yay, yay. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a weird clap thing I just did. <laughs> Yay, triangle clap. Yay, triangles. <laughs> uh, what stories do you have for us today? Aye, aye, aye. Uh, well, Dan, I have two stories. It's very thematic this week. All right. Both driving stories, both a loss of time, maybe, mm-hmm. or like, how did I end up here? And then how was I never able to find this place ever again? Ooh, so, nice. So a strange little uh, something or another there. And in the first story, we have, along with the loss of like time and space, a possible skinwalker sighting. Interesting. C- okay. C- 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 combo. <laughs> nice, nice. You're welcome. Uh, my first of two stories takes place down in sunny Costa Rica. Ooh, take me away. Mm-hmm. A college student explores the supposedly very haunted uh, the ruins. I'll explain what those are when we get into the story. Uh, but basically, the remnants of the old massive church, and claim to come face to not really face with its infamous ghost. So, lore and modern encounter story combo there. And then for the next story, we're going to head to Connecticut to go over the legend of Hannah Crana, <laughs> a.k.a. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of a goofy little story, a.k.a. the Wicked Witch of Monroe. Oh, but, is this about our daughter? I know, Monroe, yeah. Uh, is she so wicked? Not a scary story to me at all, just an interesting old paranormal legend. And I'll be able to share some kind of like uh, random facts about what people used to think about witches, which I find interesting. And I'll keep that second story pretty short. So longer first one, shorter second one. Sounds good. Uh, as you get your socks, what kind of socks do you have? Okay, these are very special socks. On the bottom, they say, I'm a badass unicorn. I do what I want. Cute. And what makes them extra, extra special is that they came from Grandma Diane. Oh, nice. I know. So cute. Grandma Diane is our kid's stepdad's mom. So yes. she's like our our other, she's our extra grandma. She's our yeah. bonus grandma. Mm-hmm. She's good friends with my mom. And it's like a very sweet little relationship we have. So it is cool. Thanks, Grandma Diane. Yeah, thank you. I am, in fact, a badass unicorn. That's what my friends say. (laughs) You are. You are. Thank you. Okay. So you ready for some history and horror down in Costa Rica? Yes, please. All right. A little bit of setup, and then we'll get into the story. Uh, Las Ruinas de la Parroquia was once- Well done. Thank you. Was once a church in Cartago. There we go. Cartago, Costa Rica. Cartago is the original capital of Costa Rica, located just a few miles past the outer suburbs of the current capital of San Jose. And the parish was constructed in 1575 as a shrine to St. James the Apostle and then first damaged by an earthquake in 1630. The building was demolished in 1656. New construction built over the same foundation finished in 1662. And then in 1718, church was damaged by a second massive earthquake. Oh, dear. Then a third uh, large earthquake in 1756 further damaged the structure. 
And then the parish was destroyed again, I September se- uh, 2nd, 1841, by another earthquake, uh, the San Antolin earthquake. In 1870, there was another attempt to rebuild the church on the same grounds, this time by engineer Louis Locke, German architect Francisco Kurtz. Construction ended up being halted for 30 years, then restarted in 1903 or 1904, then finally canceled altogether in 1910. Do you want to guess why? Earthquake. Another massive earthquake. I guys, I'm genius. The Santa Monica earthquake. And now construction was abandoned. The site was just clearly way too susceptible to the area's earthquakes to build a large structure full of fragile elements like large amounts of stained glass uh, to keep trying to rebuild it. So the ruins were declared a historic relic in 1982. Uh, Las Ruinas de la Parroquia are also called the Cartago Church Ruins, Cartago Parish Ruins, or the Santiago Apostle Parish Ruins, mostly just referred to as the ruins. And the ruins are located directly next to Plaza Mayor, the city's central park. The entire area takes up two large city blocks. There are now sometimes concerts, craft fairs, other events held in this beautifully uh, manicured public space. Today, the massive stone outer walls of the old parish are still standing, and inside those walls is a public garden where many people like to go for walks, picnics, spend time outdoors, but only until sundown. At night, no one enters the interior of the old ruins because the inner courtyard is locked up. But even if it wasn't locked, few would enter because the Cartago Church ruins are reportedly one of the most haunted places in all of Costa Rica. Some believe that the ruins are cursed. According to local lore, The ghost of a headless priest wanders the ruins at night. There are two versions of the legend regarding how this ghost became attached to the ruins, both ending in tragedy. In one version of the legends, many years before the earthquakes, a local priest in Cartago was murdered by his own brother. Why? The priest broke his vows and had an affair with his brother's wife. Oh, dear. And then his brother, jealous and angry, decided he needed to have his revenge and murdered his brother, then buried his body on church grounds. I mean, I kind of get it. Because this brother also happened to be uh, the mayor, he was able to use his political influence to hide what he had done and get away with it. In another version of the story, the priest's brother was not married. Both men fell in love with the same woman. And in the end, she chose the priest's brother. And the priest was so angry, he decided to pursue an affair despite his brother. And when that didn't work, when the woman rejected him because she loved his brother, the priest murdered his romantic rival and sibling during the 1577 New Year's Mass on the grounds of the ruins and again hid the body and got away with murder. Either way, whether victim or murderer, the story goes that the priest is the one who cursed the grounds. How he may have lost his head is lost to history. The following story comes from one person who claimed that they saw the ghost of this headless priest while wandering around the ruins late one night. Time now for the tale of It Came from the Ruins. Lucas hadn't known he wanted to study abroad until he saw a poster of a beach in Costa Rica hanging on the wall of a drab campus building. The white sand and bright blue water caught his eye on the way to class one afternoon. It was cold and raining that day, and he stopped for a moment to imagine himself on that warm and sunny beach. Then he read the words beneath the picture, a promotion for a study abroad program for pre-med students at the University of Costa Rica. It seemed like a sign. Lucas was a pre-med major and working on a minor in Spanish. A semester away from home sounded perfect to him. sounded like a dream. But then he quickly put it out of his head and went to class. It was probably too expensive just a fantasy. But he couldn't stop thinking about the study abroad program as the week continued. He'd gone online to read more about it and the idea became more appealing each day, especially after he actually looked into the costs. It seemed like he would need to come up with very little additional money to do it. Mostly, he just needed to save up to buy a plane ticket. Amazing. By the end of the week, Lucas was now determined to go and found himself emailing the program's director to set up a meeting to talk about the cost and payment plans. All the pieces were falling into place. His scholarships would cover the cost of tuition for his classes, since his classes would be transferable credits, and the director gave him information on cheap student housing, also covered by grants and student loans he'd already taken out. In the four months he had before the next semester started, Lucas worked as many extra shifts as possible at the campus coffee shop, and even got a second part-time job as a dishwasher at a local restaurant. He'd reached his savings goal with just two weeks to spare. He'd have spending money for his study abroad program and not have to work for the semester. All of the long hours and exhaustion were worth it as Lucas stepped off the plane and took his very first steps in Costa Rica. It was his first time leaving the country and he was the happiest he had literally ever been. His first few weeks were amazing, but definitely an adjustment as well. He was thrown into the deep end of the pool when it came to learning Spanish and had more than his fair share of awkward moments. moments. 
Like he, like when he was in a Spanish class and was trying to say he was excited to be in Costa Rica, but ended up saying something else that he was a different kind of excited. <laughs> his embarrassing mistake caught the attention of a program tutor, Alex, who, after a good laugh at his expense, offered to tutor him in the library on Wednesday afternoons. Alex, as it turned out, was friends with one of his roommates, Nico. And within just a few weeks, Lucas felt like he had two solid friends. One Saturday, Nico invited Lucas with he and Alex to visit a small city called Cartago, about 30 minutes from the university, which was in San Pedro. Their friend Sophia was playing at a small music festival, and they had promised to come out and support her. At the festival, Lucas was introduced to Sophia and her sister, Vanessa. And Vanessa was gorgeous. He was very excited to meet her, the kind he had accidentally said in class. <laughs> Lucas was instantly attracted to her and they struck up a conversation easily. And after Sophia played her set on stage, she offered to show him around town. But Nico and Alex needed to head back. Bummer. Despite leaving disappointed that evening, Vanessa followed him on Instagram so they could message each other after he left. And she did message him. She told Lucas that if he came back the next weekend, he could see her after she finished up her shift waiting tables at a local restaurant. And he did return. And now they were kind of dating. Costa Rica just kept getting better. They visited each other for the next several weeks, sometimes just the two of them, sometimes as a group with Alex, Nico, and Sophia. And during one of the group outings, they strolled through the city's central plaza, and Vanessa told him all about the Cartago Parish ruins. He laughed when she told him about the ghost of the headless priest that supposedly came out after dark. But Vanessa and the others insisted that it was no joke. It was too real. Lucas saw the grave looks on their faces and felt a bit bad for laughing. He had just never been one to believe in ghosts. Not really. He'd never really thought about the concept much. He wasn't into horror movies. None of his friends were either. Just not his thing. But he prided himself on being pretty open-minded, so maybe. Who knows? Certainly wasn't something that scared him, though. After they'd eaten dinner and had a few drinks at a downtown bar, they now headed out to walk Vanessa and Sophia to their car before they went home for the night. That was when Vanessa touched her neck and let out a gasp. My necklace! It's gone! She now explained on the verge of tears how her grandmother gave it to her before she passed away, and it was one of her most prized possessions. They all went inside the bar to check the floor, ask anyone if they had seen it. No one had. They tried to retrace their steps that evening until they ended up back at the park near the church ruins. Everyone in the group, even Vanessa, hesitated to continue the search. Vanessa, Sophia said gently, you probably lost it in the park earlier. I hate to say it, but I would think that someone had picked it up already. I don't think we're going to find it. I can't believe I lost it. She said, tears filling her eyes again. I'll never forgive myself. Don't cry, Lucas said, wrapping an arm around her shoulders. Why don't we walk along the path we took earlier and try and see if we can spot it? It's worth at least one last try, isn't it? Alex gave him a sharp look and subtly shook his head, trying to get him to drop the subject. Lucas scoffed. Seriously, guys, it's a paved pathway and we're all together. Why can't we go look? I'm not going near the parish at night. I'm sorry, Vanessa, Alex said. Nico murmured his agreement. Even Sophia, although she patted her sister's shoulder comfortingly, she didn't offer to help her look for her beloved necklace. Lucas was a bit shocked. They really believed in some of these old ghost stories. Vanessa nodded her head in acceptance, a defeated slump to her shoulders. I'll go then, Lucas said. Just give me like 20 minutes to look around. Would you really do that for me? Vanessa asked. Yeah, he said, shrugging his shoulders. Why not? It's just, she hesitated, shooting a nervous look at the dark path ahead and the looming structure of the church. Vanessa, I'm not worried about some old ghost. I'll be fine. Lucas, she said, but then Alex cut her off. We can't stop you, man, but I don't think it's a good idea. I'll be fine. I'll be back in 20 minutes. Hopefully I can find it. Lucas now set off down the path, not turning around to look at the others. He tried to shake off his irritation. What was with everyone unwilling to help Vanessa over silly superstition? They were adults, not little children. Whatever. You know what? This was actually great. If he found it, now he's the hero. He's returned a family heirloom to its rightful, very attractive owner. Lucas now walked down the dimly lit path, keeping an even pace, eyes super focused on the ground below him, looking for a glint of silver in the grass. He knew that finding the necklace was a long shot. But what if? He could see the ruins looming in the distance. He wouldn't be able to go inside since they were closed after dark, but he could stroll the perimeter. They had peeked in through some of the old windows earlier that day. Maybe the necklace fell off then? Lucas made his way along the side of the building, keeping close to the walls and using his phone as a flashlight. He looked around and thought it was odd that he couldn't see anyone else in the streets nearby. 
He could have sworn he had just heard people talking and laughing off in the distance. It was an eerie feeling being alone in the city center, but he wouldn't say he was scared. After 15 minutes of searching, Lucas sighed in defeat. He had walked around the outer walls and found nothing. Damn it. Where was it? Vanessa's necklace would definitely be gone by the time he came back next weekend and could look for it in the daylight. If this was even where she had lost it. Oh well, at least he tried. Lucas began the walk back to the bar feeling defeated where his friends were waiting on him. As he was walking, a dark flash of movement to his right caught his eye. He was passing what was once the main entrance to the Grand Parish, where there were steps leading up to the gated archway. He thought it was probably a stray animal until he heard what sounded like footsteps. Lucas looked around. He could see some people off in the distance, but no one too close. Hoping there weren't any police officers nearby, he walked up the steps to take a closer look, but turned off his flashlight, not wanting to draw attention to himself. He wasn't sure if he was allowed to peek into the ruins at night or not. He could barely see into the dark structure, but still, he swore he saw the dark outline of a man's body straight ahead of him, near the other side of the parish walls. What was he doing in there? Lucas chuckled to himself. Probably some drunk idiot who had got himself locked inside until morning. He did think it was a little odd how he hadn't heard the man the entire time he'd been looking for the necklace. Shouldn't he be calling for someone to let him out? Or maybe hiding? Instead of just quietly standing there? The man took one step closer, bringing his body further out of the shadows. Lucas gasped and took a step back. The man's head was gone. Lucas shook his head back and forth, trying to clear his vision. The figure was still there, and it was still missing its head. What the fuck? Lucas whispered to himself, still in disbelief at what he was seeing. He wasn't drunk, and he definitely hadn't taken anything, so how was he seeing a man with no head who was somehow standing on two feet? Oh, God. He's walking again. The headless man took a few steps closer to Lucas. He was still very far away on the other side of the ruins, but Lucas felt like he was still too close for comfort. Lucas's jaw dropped as the man lifted a hand and he saw something silver shining under the dim moonlight. He couldn't make out the details, but a sick feeling in his gut confirmed that the thing had what he was looking for. It had Vanessa's necklace. I, I, Lucas started, unable to form a coherent thought. Hey, give it back. He sounded pathetic to his own ears. Also, he thought to himself, what was he even doing talking to a headless man? Was this even real? He wanted to laugh. This was absurd. He almost wished a police officer would stop and question him. Maybe they could see the headless man too and he wouldn't feel so crazy. Or maybe he was crazy and they would take him somewhere to get his head examined. I I need that, Lucas said weakly. The figure took one step closer. Lucas suddenly felt a strong stabbing pain in his abdomen. He doubled over, clutching his midsection. What was happening? Had he been stabbed? Had someone snuck up on him and attacked him when he was focused on the man inside the parish? The pain was so intense it brought tears to his eyes. Lucas found himself stumbling back and briefly experienced the sensation of falling. And then, everything stopped. He woke up to Alex's hands, gently shaking him. Lucas! Lucas! A soft voice called his name. Lucas opened his eyes and saw Vanessa kneeling above him. Lucas, you're awake! After taking a moment to collect himself, he groaned. What happened? It came back to him a moment later. Lucas's hand went to his side. He thought it would come away covered in blood, but there was nothing. He didn't feel any pain in his abdomen, but his head was killing him. A quick inspection revealed he had a nasty lump on the back of his head. What just happened? He could hear Vanessa in the background, trying to focus on her words. We're so worried when you didn't come back for almost an hour. We went looking for you and found you on the steps. Looked like you had fallen backwards and hit your head. You were unconscious. Are you all right? I think we should take you to the hospital. Lucas tried to stand up after a quick stumble. He was right on his feet and insisted that he didn't need to go to the ER. He didn't say anything about the headless man. He needed to process everything before talking about it. He said he must have fallen on the stairs and hit his head, which appeared to be true. But what made him fall? He was reluctant to believe it, but it almost seemed like the man had been trying to kill him, like he had stabbed and pushed Lucas without even touching him. But that was impossible, right? As a med student, Lucas knew that there could be all sorts of explanations for unexplained abdominal pain and sudden dizziness. He hit the books the next day, searching for something, anything, to explain what had happened to him. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like science could explain this one. At least not for the moment. Lucas tried to put it out of his mind and focus on school that following week. He almost succeeded until Friday afternoon. He was supposed to head back to Cartago that night to see Vanessa for the first time since the necklace debacle. But then as he walked into his room, something laying on his bed caught his eye. No. 
No, he told himself. No, 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 it couldn't be. Vanessa's silver necklace was laying on the center of his bed, as if someone had come into his room while he was out and gently set it there. He quickly locked the door and stepped inside. For some reason, he felt a sense of panic rather than relief. He tried to think through it all logically, but he couldn't. He highly doubted that someone had stalked him for a whole week just to return a necklace they'd found and then laid on his bed. He thought it could have been one of his roommates playing a joke at him. He hoped that's what was a, what it was, but that didn't sit right with him. They weren't pranksters, and they wouldn't use Vanessa's necklace to, for a cruel joke. They would immediately tell her they'd found it. Lucas had a strong feeling that the headless man had something to do with this, as crazy as it sounded. What was even crazier to him was the fact that now he didn't want to return the necklace to Vanessa, not if that thing had touched it. What if he could then find Vanessa and hurt her too? Again, it sounded crazy, but he just knew that now he couldn't let Vanessa have the necklace. He felt like it was contaminated, ruined, cursed. Now that it had been touched by whatever darkness surrounded the man inside, he saw inside the parish. That night, instead of going to Cartago with his roommates, Lucas feigned illness. He messaged Vanessa and told her he was sorry and he'd try and come see her on Sunday if he felt better. When all was quiet in the house, Lucas stepped outside carrying the silver necklace in his hand. There was a creek just a short walk away from student housing, behind a small park. Lucas walked through that park, bypassing the picnic tables and playground and heading to the trees where the creek was easily accessible. He threw Vanessa's necklace into the water and immediately turned around and didn't dare to look behind him. He swore he felt phantom eyes on him the entire walk home. Lucas never told Vanessa what he saw or what he did with the necklace, but eventually the secret aided him until he posted his story online as a sort of confession. Lucas hopes that no one will ever find that necklace and that the headless man will remain inside the parish walls where his evil will be at least somewhat contained. Weird. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that would freak me out. Yeah, my favorite part of that story was the uh, the detail of the necklace showing back up like a week later. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. Because the the thought of somebody being in your space without your permission alone, just like yeah, a, a, a break violation. or anything. Yeah, it's so, it's such an intimate violation. On and your bed? I know, I know. But then to think that it was a ghost, mm-hmm. you know, or or some entity of, a, of another world. Yeah. So then you're... Uh, there's no like uh, preventing them from coming back. It's not like an actual robber. Right. Where you, you know, you like lock the door, security system. It's like, nope, that's mm-hmm. not going to work. Mm-hmm. I like his thought on just tossing it out of the creek. I mean, it's like if that thing was maybe maybe attached to it, I don't know. But then how did it take it there? I don't, she may have just dropped it. Like it may have actually just broken, like the clasp just broke. Totally. And then the ghost picked it up. And <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, I don't know. And and then I almost scary would be the option of somebody not in their friends group finding it, and instead of like giving it back like a normal person, laying it on the bed like that's that's, that's some that's, serial killer shit. I know exactly. That's creepier. Yeah, yeah like, but I don't uh, think that's weird, what happened. No, uh-uh. no. I thought he was gonna like take it outside and melt it in a fire or something. <laughs> like I I wanted it to be Go find a kiln. Yeah, some blacksmith's <laughs> cauldron or something. I just wanted it to be completely gone. I don't. Yeah. I didn't want the opportunity for anyone else to find it. Yeah. But I wonder in that situation. Okay, like let's just say you could melt the metal down, and then the metal gets used for something else. I wonder if that, like, if it disperses the spirit yeah, that's attached knows? to it. Like, I wonder what those rules are. Oh yeah, like if it's like like if there's a cursed object or a haunted object. Yeah. And then you melt the object down and form it into a new object. Yeah. yeah. Like what that does. I don't or, know. or what if that. Uh, melted down metal gets split into multiple objects, then are mm-hmm. each of those objects then haunted or now I just cursed? Had a, ra- a random thought about how haunted the ocean could be with like oh all, the, all the plastics that end up in the ocean where if like a lot of haunted dolls end up being like recycled and then they're plastic, <laughs> it's like uh, put in landfills and then some of the trash from one of these places ends up in the ocean. I was just thinking about the plastic bottles. Like, are we oh, just yeah. drinking out of possessed haunted <laughs> plastic bottles? What an idea. I have some pictures. Okay. It is a really cool looking place. Uh, this first one, just a you know, picture of the ruins. Few people on the left for scale. And so the, oh, old, the old walls are massive. Massive. So yeah, so the church was damaged in an earthquake and then not rebuilt eventually. I mean, so many earthquakes, like five or six. Yeah. But I mean, the walls remain and they are huge stone walls. Do you know what the actual measurement of I the don't. walls is? I don't. That's insane. That, those, those people, people look are like tiny. dots. Mm-hmm. Small little dots. And then here's another pic, Photoshop to include a, a headless priest. Dun, dun, uh, dun, dun. It's like just a different angle of the walls. It's really pretty. It is. And then, and actually, there's one more shot from above so you can see the interior and, again, kind of speak to the scale of the ruins. But it's cool what they did Whoa. with that, uh, you know, that central area. 
all like manicured and there's like little uh, walkways and stuff inside there. Like, yeah, it's just, it turned into a park. And then to the, like the top right corner of the picture, that's the beginning of that big public square. So oh, it's like okay, one okay. block is the old ruins of this, you know, church. And then the next block is this big public square. So together, it's a really cool central area of the city. That is really cool. You can, uh, the way that like the, um, not the foundation, because it's more than the foundation, but what's left of the walls is laid out. It looks almost like they just, uh, what do you call that? Like they, they, they bisected it, dissected it oh, in half yeah, and yeah, just yeah. like split it open. Well, I forget what that's called, like a, some kind of gram, but, uh. It's so cool. I know. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, with like how smooth the top. And I don't know if that was like uh, renovation efforts, but yeah. So apparently, like the earthquake, you know, what I'm guessing they they couldn't get around. What kept crumbling was the roof, which makes sense. The uh, the chapel part or yeah. the cathedral, Ba-doo. you know. Especially, I mean, that you know, initially built back in the 16th century. And I know that back in Rome and those places in England, yes, they were building massive structures at that time, but it had to have been a little bit different when you just got across the Atlantic and you're trying to do that same kind of construction there. I imagine you don't have the resources, the same amount of like professional builders, architects, that sure, kind of stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah. And just like uh, the the soil, the ground is different. Like yeah, it's something just so with many... the foundation must have been bad for like... Because the earthquake wasn't destroying the whole city every single time. I know. But I mean, that building, I'm sure, was by far the biggest building in the city. Also, the the land there might just be cursed. Mm, yeah, maybe. I mean, I definitely thought that when you said like earthquake after earthquake, it's like something doesn't want you to build there. They don't want a church there. Or just anything. Yeah, yeah. Why, why you got to make it about the church? Because that's, that's the curse part. Some some wicked creature. Well, a priest. Yeah. Mm, but Yeah. Uh, any more questions about that one? No, the whole time I was just thinking about, do you know the Wayfair Chapel in Palos Verdes? Have I you don't. ever been there? It's, nope. When you were talking about this, I was like, oh man, I bet that chapel has some stories. It's this beautiful, beautiful all glass chapel in PV. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can rent it now for like weddings and stuff, but it's just like this, it's not that big, huh. beautiful, beautiful chapel. But it made me start thinking about that. And then like just various chapels. I'm like, they should all be haunted because theoretically- Chapels are used for funerals. Mm, mm-hmm. So old hospitals, old chapels. Yeah, add it to the list of haunted places. Okay, well, time now to head north from Costa Rica up to Connecticut. Very far north. Very far north, home state of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Although I don't believe that those two demonologists uh, ever worked on trying to talk to or banish this particular entity. I thought you were going to say those two demons. Those those two demony folk. And now for some interesting American witchcraft lore. Uh, No setup. We're just going to jump right in. Time now for the tale of Hannah Crana. Gregory's Four Corners Burial Ground is a cemetery that was established around uh, or in the around 35,000 person town of Trumbull, Connecticut, over two and a half centuries ago in 1761. The cemetery is also near the smaller around 18,000 person town of Monroe. And one of the most well-known people buried there is Hannah Hovey, a.k.a. the Wicked Witch of Monroe, uh, more commonly known as Hannah Crana. And she was the wife of Captain Joseph Hovey. Hannah lived in the area from 1773 to 1859. She and her husband, Captain Joseph Hovey, would have no children together. That alone made Hannah a unique woman for her time. Making her more unique was not remarrying anyone after Joseph's death. Hannah's husband died under mysterious circumstances as well. He went out for a walk one night and just fell off a cliff or jumped or was pushed. His death was considered a suspicious accident because it was said he knew the train of the area very well. The residents of Monroe suspected that Hannah might have cast a spell on her husband and caused confusion and disorientation, which led to him falling off the cliff. Childless and now widowed, after her husband died mysteriously, she must be a witch, was the thinking of too many locals of the time. Rather than vehemently deny accusations of witchcraft made against her, which back then could have led to her arrest or even execution if her denials seemed to give more credence to the accusations, the whole Shakespearean, the lady doth protest too much, methinks, uh, she instead let her reputation quietly terrify locals and leaving her alone. Soon, by those who thought she was a witch, Hannah was referred to as Hannah Crana, for reasons never completely explained, uh, aside from rhyming, Crana is Scottish for a rocky or lofty place, maybe a nod to the supposedly Satan-stamped rock near her home. That was another rumor, that the devil visited her and left evidence of his appearance on a large rock near her home. Okay. Hannah, as I mentioned, never remarried for the rest of her life. She wore the traditional black clothing of a widow, which added to her mystery and intrigue. 
She lived alone in a house on Cragley Hill near modern-day Cutler's Farm Road. Uh, local lore claims that her home was guarded by snakes. Then there was the large rock I mentioned, marked with what looked like a cloven footprint, supposedly a, a definite sign that Hannah Crana was working with the devil. Edward Nichols Coffee wrote about Hannah Crana in his 1974 book, A Glimpse of Old Monroe, writing, Hannah surveyed her domain from a rock seat still found on the edge of Cutler's Farm Road. Here, his satanic majesty allegedly appeared and left the mark of his cloven hoof. Another rumor, an even stranger one, was that birds on her property couldn't be killed by hunters. The bullets always missed their mark. Hannah lived in poverty after her husband's death and was known to ask her neighbors for food and firewood in her later years. And if they weren't willing to share with her, it said she used her reputation as a witch to terrify them into handing over their resources. She wouldn't say she was a witch, but she, uh, she would say that bad things were going to happen to them. Coffee wrote, A victim of charity, she was perhaps more shrewd than most in her era and seldom lacked for firewood and food. She knew that area folk were partial to superstitions and by threatening them with dire misfortunes, she tricked her neighbors into accommodating her. As her infamy grew, many catered to her since few wished to draw her displeasure and wrath. One story says that a neighbor who had recently baked some pies gave Hannah the smallest of the batch when she asked for one. And then when Hannah asked her for a bigger pie, she said no. So Hannah allegedly put a spell on her and her pies were never quite as good again as they were the day she was cursed. And that might be the cutest slash funniest curse I've ever heard of. Cursed to have less tasty pies. <laughs> one young man trespassed on Hannah's property to go fishing and Hannah allegedly uh, said to the young man, curses upon you and your fishing. Uh, she supposedly cursed him uh, so that he would never again catch fish. Hannah Crana, queen of not scary curses. Queen of annoying curses, it seems. One farmer asked Hannah to use her mysterious power to bring rain during a long drought. Hannah told the farmer that if he had faith, it would rain the next day. And then it did rain. After this incident, some of the townspeople now viewed Hannah as some kind of deity. Others weren't buying it, though. Two men driving a cart full of hay stopped by Hannah's house to mock her one day. The men with the cart sarcastically asked Hannah to show off her magic, and she is said to have responded, Before you pass yonder tree, your wish shall be granted. The men laughed, they moved on, but then they were shocked and horrified when suddenly their oxen refused to move and the wheels fell off. Coffee wrote about the incident. Laughing, they coaxed the oxen, and although the cart was on a downgrade, no amount of tugging was able to move it. The nuts loosened on the cart, the wheels came off, and the oxen ran away, leaving the men looking on in despair. The men headed for home, and it was days before the oxen were found. Hannah, in the midst of all of this, was actually arrested for consorting with the devil. But her case never went to trial, and she was quickly released. She was most likely never brought to trial for these accusations because of the lingering shame of the Salem witch trials from over a century earlier. Hannah Cranna is perhaps uh, most well-known for predicting her own death. In 1859, Hannah's favorite rooster, Old Boreas, <laughs> okay. died, and locals believed that Old Boreas was Hannah's familiar. After her rooster's death, Hannah told a neighbor that she was going to die soon. Hannah told her neighbor that after a heavy snowstorm, these spirits have called and it won't be but a short time before I will be in the great beyond. I have a wish to make that must be carried out. I am not to be buried until after sundown and there must be ample bears to carry my coffin from the house to the grave. Obey my wishes if you would avoid trouble and vexation. Hannah also requested that her coffin be carried to the cemetery by hand, not pulled on a cart or a sled. According to the legend, Hannah died soon after giving these instructions. It was snowing on the day of her funeral, and locals were reluctant to carry a casket and trudge it through the snow. They used a sled to pull Hannah's coffin, but it repeatedly fell off and onto the snowy ground. After the first time the coffin fell, some of the teams sat on top of it, and now they were thrown off into the snow. As Coffee wrote, Traveling only a short distance, those involved were given quite a jolt. The coffin slid off the cart and ended up halfway down the hill toward the house. Next, they secured it with chains and several of the more daring men it sat atop. As they descended the final hill, the coffin began to shake, dumping those astride it. This happening so frightened the townsfolk, who gathered that they agreed to follow Hannah's final request. So it came to be that her body, in the old tradition, was carried on the menfolk's shoulders to the gravesite, just over the town line into Trumbull. They arrived at sundown and disposed of their duties as quickly as possible. They eventually gave up and carried her coffin to her grave, as she had instructed. Good thing they did. No telling what other curses may have befallen them. Perhaps they'd all have to eat drier bread than before, or suffer through colder porridge, or not quite as strong as before mead or something. When the crowd then returned to Hannah's home, 
They found it burning to the ground, and they wondered what secrets burned with it. Rumors have persisted ever since her burial that Hannah's ghost haunts the cemetery she was laid to rest in. Today, visitors to the cemetery report disembodied whispers and laughter, mysterious orbs captured on camera, and even a spirit seen walking along the road, sometimes suddenly appearing in front of cars and causing some of them to crash. So a lot scarier in death than she was in life, it seems. Hannah Crana was a mysterious woman during her life, and the mystery of her death has only added to the lore of the Wicked Witch of Monroe. But was she really wicked? Seems like she helped some people. And she did give specific burial, uh, burial instructions in order to avoid anything horrible happening after her death. Was she really a witch, or just a widowed, grieving woman living alone during an era when society found it strange and unnatural to do that? A strange old lady that creeped people out. And she was maybe aware of that. And in her later years, used her reputation to get a little help from time to time. I like it. Yeah, me too. What's that movie we just watched with the kids? With Colin oh, Farrell? Oh, I cannot remember. It's a new movie. It's like set in like Ireland during the Troubles. And it's this ah, kind of well-known like Irish actor. And I older guy, I can't remember his name. I know. I and then Colin Farrell. Yes. And it is a crazy movie, but it's up for a bunch of awards. But yeah, it's about this feud between these two guys. And then the old lady the in that, old lady, this that like, seems like a witch. She seems like a witch. She's uh -huh. hilarious. She is. She just like shows up and she just kind of stares people down. And then she'll say creepy things like, yep. two people are going to die. You should hope you're not one of them. Uh -huh. And then of course, two people die. And it's, yep. it, but it's like so silly because it could have been anybody, right? Like yeah. her curses, her predictions yeah. are nonsensical unless you want to give credence to them mm -hmm. was it the banshees oh. of uh, yes that's it i don't know how to say that i don't want to like destroy the last name it's like it's the Irish banshees name. of something you have some gaelic name did you see it too uh nope i just looked it up for you oh thank, oh, you. thank you it looks good though it was really it was, it was actually really good it's very strange yeah yeah very strange i know i don't want to give away this thing that happens this <laughs> running gag that is just <laughs> so like what just shocking that, for enough. the tone of the movie yeah yeah but K kyler did describe it as a dramedy yeah. I was like, okay, it's very dry, very dry. Yeah, it's a slow burn. Very slow. Um, so a few picks here. This first one, Tombstone of Hannah Crana in Gregory's Four Corners Burial Ground in Trumbull, Connecticut. Hannah Crana. Yeah, on her tombstone, Hannah Crana, wife Funny. of Captain Joseph Hovey. Uh, and then this uh, next uh, picture, this is a 16th century illustration of a witch feeding her familiars. Oh, yes, yeah, so we need to talk about familiars. <laughs> yeah, yep. I'll okay. explain that. And that lady looks like the lady from the movie. <laughs> she does. The classic witch. Uh, and then uh, last one, pick a Gregory's Four Corners burial ground. Doesn't look too spooky, but you know, a lot of places don't in the daylight. Oh, it's actually really pretty. Mm -hmm. Just a little small cemetery. Yeah, very small, tiny little headstones. And then, okay, okay. so this whole witch's familiar explanation. In yeah, let's talk about that. In Western demonology, a familiar is a witch's attendant, a, a helper basically oh. assisting her in her dark magic uh, given to her by the devil or inherited from another witch. Of course. The attendant is a low ranking demon that has assumed an animal shape. Most often in, in lore, uh, the familiar appears as a black cat. Oh, so that's the black okay. cat, you know, is the, is the classic familiar that, um, you know, has been around a long time. You know, it's like this ancient, well, it's like, you know, minor demon, the spirit handed down from witch to witch yeah. often and uh, assists the witch in making spells you know, brewing up potions and whatnot. Do you think that Penny and Gigi could be familiars? Penny, maybe. Uh, Gigi would be a pretty dumb familiar. I love, we love Gigi, but you know that she's not very smart. I disagree. Sometimes we think she might be smart. I but, think she's but, smarter uh, than we give her credit for. I, I, go, I go back and if forth. If there is sniffing or balls involved, <laughs> she is on it. She <laughs> loves her squeaky balls. I just think about tossing a piece of uh, food to her. <laughs> And it literally just hitting her between the eyes and just bound. And she knows this. She knows this food. She knows it's coming. Or even just hitting her in the nose. And it doesn't bother her. Just, hmm. It's like she's like in those moments, cartoonishly dumb. Like it it is really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Where Penny, she is on it. Penny's mouth is already open. <laughs> uh huh. She's grabbing it out of the air. Penny Penny's seems like to frog. read people's moods well. Yeah. Yeah. Penny. Penny never misses a scrap. When I was looking up that familiar explanation, I have some random weird trivia about okay. witches for you. Let's have it. <laughs> it involves animals as well. During the European witchcraft trials of the 15th through 17th centuries, the familiar was believed to subsist, you know, to stay alive by sucking blood from a witch's fingers or other protuberances on her body, such as a mole or a wart. Oh. So a suspected witch would be searched for these little uh, so-called teats, these little uh, familiar teats, ew, by ew, which ew, she ew. supposedly fed her familiar. And if found, they were considered sure signs of her guilt. So if you had a wart 
or like a skin yeah, if tag. Yeah, like, if you had like an odd looking wart or a skin tag that they thought might have a little hole where the 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 blood would come out to feed your familiar, it's like, well, well there, there you have it. Proof, foolproof. Def- just, definitely a witch. Let's burn her. I'm just thinking about little kids and how they all get planters warts in their feet, and then the idea of like some weird creature sucking on the heel of a child with its planters wart. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's disgusting. Yep. It's a sneaky little witch teat. And stop saying teat. It's <laughs> such a weird word. It is. Kind of grosses me out. You get a couple of teats. Stop. Oh, okay. I don't like it. I feel about teat the mm-hmm. way most people feel about moist. Do you have moist teats? You're so gross. That is, <laughs> <laughs> that is the most disgusting thing. <laughs> Babies don't think so. Babies love. Stop, 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 <laughs> stop, stop. Because you're disgusting. Uh, what is wrong with you? I don't know. Are you 12? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. All right. Oh, no, I forgot to set you up with the Layla. Do you have one I, over I got one. I, I checked it out before the show. I got the same one as last week. Give me a little red Layla. Crisis averted. Is that one? Oh, no, that one has two arms. I, I couldn't remember which of our Laylas recently became a partial amputee. Yeah, double amputee. That's the the. Oh, she became a double. Yeah, because she's missing both both arms. I didn't. I didn't remember both arms going. No, she's over there on the couch. Oh, she's, she's resting. She's, she's, on, she's on. Yeah, she's resting up. It took a lot out of her to lose both of her arms. She's recovering from her. Yeah. Her surgery. Totally. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I have, like I said, two tales about potentially like lost time or seeing something that's not there or getting lost, but not being able to make your way back to that lost space. Yeah. And actually, I'm just thinking about this in this moment. Do you remember that tale I told quite a while ago about a mom and a daughter and they went to the Oregon coast and they stayed in a hotel? And Yes. Oh, I wish I could remember which episode that was. It is such a great story. <laughs> that was. They come home and then they like attempt to go back to this place the following weekend. And just no one's heard of it. No one's heard of it. It does. It literally doesn't exist, but they have a receipt yeah. from this place, which is the like the most peculiar detail. Detail. No, I love that story. Oh, I just remembered that. Yeah, well, it's like they slipped into a parallel universe for a uh, weekend. Yes, true. Well, this is like a classic, like you're never going to believe yeah, that this yeah. ever happened kind of tale. Two friends taking a, a road trip. And it's like, you know, I was thinking about, I have taken road trips with my girlfriends and yeah. I wondered how you would respond if I came home and was like, oh my God, you're never going to believe what Liz and I saw. Would you have it give de- it credit or would you be like, you guys it are depend- insane? It depends on what you... um you know, said you saw, depends on the friend you were with. So what uh, you're saying is if it was Liz, if it was Liz, house. I love Liz. You know, I love Liz. Uh, but Liz, like you, is, I would describe her, can, she can be excitable. Excitable? Mm-hmm. And, Why don't you uh, just say we're dramatic and crazy? And the, two, and the two of you together, I could see getting <laughs> each other quite worked up. This is true. Over something real, but also over something maybe not as real. What if I was with Emily? I would give it more credence. Not that's that's absurd. Emily's more witchy than Liz and I combined. But but I, in my experience, Emily doesn't seem as excitable. Like she's just a very calm, steady presence. Oh man, you should see us when the three of us are together. Are, are the, she's the exact same? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe if you're like with Darcy. Oh, okay. Because she's a scientist. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. I like how we're going to like go through like a list of friends to see. <laughs> like them all. Like them all. But uh, Who's but yeah. trustworthy? But in, in, in this in, instance, in this instance. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's. I can, I can picture. I like picturing you and Liz. Dude, <laughs> I can just picture you guys really getting each other worked up. Yeah, but two, there's no one's hitting the brakes in that duo. But but two people seeing something, you've often said that like, well, if two people see it, it does. True. True. Lend credence and, to and, it, and I could believe something if it was like you and Liz. I'm not saying just that I would immediately dismiss it. I, I would just um. I would be a little more hesitant going in. Okay, okay. But so, you could, you, but you two could sell me on something. Okay, I think that if Liz and I ever see something, her and I need to get out all of our excitability before we talk to yeah, you make about a calm it. Calm presentation. Like, okay, listen. Or it depends on what it is. It depends on like you know if it's something that I'm like I don't know how you could manufacture that. Like if you saw uh, a thing, a mm-hmm. definite entity, like in the woods or whatever, and you clearly both saw it and described its face, and, and it was following you. I mean. Like a flickering something in the distance yeah. is more than like for 10 seconds, this thing approached us and was staring at us or screamed okay. at us. Then then I'd be like, ah, yeah, I guess I would I would believe it. Yeah. Okay. Then you're going to love this tale. Okay. All right. Well, let's dive in. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. I haven't been listening very long, but that doesn't mean I haven't binged the entire podcast. This story takes place in sometime in 2014 or 2015. 
It was one of those experiences that stays cemented in a person's mind for life. I've lived between Utah and Arizona for most of my life. I moved back to Utah after my oldest, closest friend started experiencing debilitating health problems. Her doctors had told her to start preparing herself mentally and her family for a cancer diagnosis. I moved in with her to help her perform daily functions. Over time, she had somewhat of a miraculous recovery. My family had actually raised her. She had lived with us through high school on and off and became close with my extended family. I had learned that my grandma and two aunts were visiting my parents in Arizona. Anna and I took time off of work, loaded up my car to head down. It was March, and that meant no bad weather anywhere in between our destinations. It's roughly an 11-hour drive, hopped up on the youth that is freely available to all 20-somethings in their prime. (laughs) We decided it would somehow make the most sense to leave after our work shifts and drive straight through. We've made this drive multiple times over the years as I have moved to Arizona upon graduating high school and have visited Utah frequently and vice versa. Sometime around 3 a.m., our overconfidence in our abilities to manhandle this drive was waning. We were delirious, cackling madly over changing song lyrics as the tires ate up the pavement and and carried us dutifully closer to our destination. I need to really, really drive home the point that we have made this trip multiple times. We know the routes. We know what way is the fastest. We know when the best travel times are. And we know where all of our exits are. For some reason, the stretch of highway seemed different. It could easily have been the burdensome press of a waning moon or the complete lack of traffic. Every so often, a pair of headlights going in the opposite direction would filter through the night, but we're talking one of those drives where the headlights happen once, maybe every half an hour. The highway was barren. I'm sure I must have been driving, I don't know, 85, 90 without even noticing, distracted by our fits of hysterical heckling and being unable to breathe from laughing so hard at the dumbest of stuff. A massive owl suddenly swooped down from beneath an overpass as we were approaching it and it flew over my car. I remember being distracted and saying something to the effect of, whoa, dude, did you see that? Rad. Anna hummed and then our GPS lit up our phones. We had somehow missed our exit. We both laughed it off and just took the next exit. We passed a sign that stated that we were on a reservation and we drove up a very, very hilly dirt road with swaths of desert on either side. You could tell the road had to have been made by the residents for ease of travel because you couldn't quite distinguish what was road and what was open land, littered with cacti and desert bushes. I've always had a bit of trouble seeing at night. Headlights trip me up and I tend to lean into that pesky anxiety a lot more when, for example, headlights make snow look like it's rising to meet you from the corner of your eye. So the hills were plentiful and my headlights barely had time to touch the dips in between before they were shining on the next swell and we were cresting it. This road seemed to go on for hours. We'd fallen into a lazy, cozy silence, but then... Anna was clutching her childhood blanket as I focused my poor, bedraggled, bloodshed eyes ahead. Music played idly, and all seemed well. There was no impending sort of discomfort or sense of supernatural. But then it began. He appeared. I saw him from the corner of my eye. Knowing my own tendencies to get stressed and excusing it, I figured it must have been something along those lines. He flickered in and out of my headlight beams ahead, staying just out of sight, even as I progressed forward on the road. When we passed where he had been standing, he wasn't there. I wondered if we'd passed a scarecrow or if I was just that tired. But then he appeared again on Anna's side of the car, just out of the headlights, intently glaring into the windshield with beady, glowing yellow pinpricks for eyes. I said nothing. I didn't want to scare her, but the mood in the car did shift wordlessly, a tangible uneasiness forcing the air to grow thick and palpable with uncertainty. I could make more of him out. He kept appearing, stepping to the edge of the road and turning sharply to face us fully. He was unkempt. He wore a hat, tall, and made of straw with the top unraveling into mismatched stabbing pokes. His overalls were barely holding on with the one strap undone completely and the other nearly sliding off. The red plaid shirt was filthy, decrepit with visible patches of dirt crushed into the fabric. The worst thing? His face. It was splotchy, colored a sickly, deathly gray and degrading off the bones that jutted against it. Holes stretched narrowly down his leathery cheeks and speckled through everything that was visible of his skin. 
I pressed on the gas, my body tense, and all I could think about was what would happen if we were to get stuck on that desolate, sandy road. I gripped the steering wheel tightly, subtly, I gripped the wheel subtly tighter and kept on moving, noting Anna's rejuvenated alertness. He kept toying with us. He would step out from behind Cacti and churn as if he was about to walk directly at the car, and then we would pass him, only for him to appear another half mile down the road. I was taking these damned hills at like 60 miles per hour, my car flying in a way I can only describe as Ferris Bueller's friend Cameron's dad's <laughs> car as the mechanic took it for a joyride. I was snapped out of my thoughts when he suddenly and inexplicably was in the middle of a peak ahead of us. I flinched, lifting my foot off the gas and nearly slamming on the brakes, but I didn't. We didn't run over anything, and he didn't get close enough for the headlights to fully illuminate him before he was simply not there. This seemed like the last straw. Anna speaks very sharply anyway, and she asked with an irate tone, her voice, Do you fucking see him? <laughs> I said, Yes. Like the weird farmer guy, right? She asked, Yeah. With the plaid overalls? Dude, shut up. I didn't like that I had mentioned him whatsoever to her. I didn't want her confrontation, and I didn't want to let my fight-or-flight response get even worse. We saw him a couple more times, Anna pointing aggressively in his direction with a scowl on her face. I only nodded each time she pointed him out with an impatient muttering of, Are you fucking kidding me? As, as if she was alarmed at his audacity to suddenly spring into our field of vision. Anna is a very confrontational person, and I had no doubt she would have stomped out of that car to demand answers had it been stationary. By the time we left that hilly road, we were both tense. We didn't speak about it, and we just kept driving. We arrived at my parents' house before anyone was awake. We parked, went in the guest room, and collapsed for a long sleep. Now, like I said, that was 2014 or 15. And obviously, if we're still on the same timeline, it's now 2021 or 2023. <laughs> I just went to Utah for a friend's wedding, and Anna came over to my hotel room to visit. The weird farmer guy had been cropping up out of literally nowhere in my mind for about a week. And I abruptly asked her, Hey, do you remember that guy we saw when we were driving to Arizona? Her eyes went wide. She confirmed and told me that she had just been telling a friend of hers about the experience a couple days prior. So I had made her stop and I recorded that conversation just to corroborate our stories. I know it sounds silly and there are plenty of things to explain it away, but it really did happen. I just made this trip last week for my friend's wedding. I still have no earthly idea what reservation it was, what route it took us down, and I have never ever been able to find it again. I have no theories as to what that thing was, but I think we should have investigated in a solid skincare routine for him. Sincerely, a happy listener and creep, Kay. Thanks, Kay. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, um, you know, uh, elements to play with in that story. Yeah. Because, you know, like, take out the hidden reservation, just the fact that they both saw this thing. Like, it's just that part of the story. Like you were saying, like, if you and Liz yes. shared that same experience and kept seeing this distinct creepy looking i mean rotten looking but just whatever kind of figure yeah popping up over and over as you're going 60 miles an hour that doesn't make any sense you know right, like right. outside of the paranormal like nothing's that fast mm -hmm. that, that could keep showing up that way and then the reservation part like outside of the the hidden unable to find again reservation that that made me think about how you know skinwalker skinwalkers do come from you know uh north american indigenous people's lore like right. various, you know, nations and tribes have their own versions. Not all of them, but many of them have their own versions of skinwalker kind of mythology. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made me think about like, I think it's called like thought forms or maybe thought constructs. But this whole concept that you can conjure something into existence by just belief in this thing. Oh, yes. That if like, like if, if a group of people are all worried about the same monster and thinking about the same agreed upon features and worrying about it and putting that energy into the universe, mm -hmm. that somehow, as opposed to the monster showing up first and scaring us and then we oh, react to it. Oh, yes. What if we create the monsters, which is just an interesting thing to play with where um, – our, our minds are so powerful that we can think things into actually being. I mean, and we we use that in other ways too, right? Like if you dream it, you can believe it. Yeah, the whole it. manifest thing. That mm -hmm. It used to be manifesting an entity that other people can actually see, which is his own kind of horror. I know that now freaks me out because I've been, the kids are back at their mom's this week and I last night was having a hard time sleeping and I swear I heard creaking from Kyler's room, which is where I always hear it from. Mm -hmm. I always hear like a, a strange, it just sounds like 
I don't even want to say footsteps. It just sounds like weight or pressure. Yeah. You know how like a floorboard kind of like just gives a little sure. when you step on it. And I didn't want to say anything. But last night when we were watching Better Call Saul, mm -hmm. uh, I had to, I like remember when I like shifted much, much closer to you. Yeah. I could just see the stairs out of the corner ah. of my eye and could just be a shadow. But I had this very uneasy feeling of like something at the top of the stairs and then this morning when i was polishing stories and you were at the gym i heard a sound from upstairs i almost leapt out of my chair like because uh, i had my back to the yep, stairs yep. and i was like oh something is fucking up right now well and then there's the, the you know other people believe that okay let's say that there is something something paranormal like an inkling of something in the house some spirit yeah. or whatever that the more you think about it the more you're scared of it that it could somehow feed off of that kind of psychic energy right and then materialize more because of that so there's all kinds of theories you know yeah. that you can create something entirely out of nothing yeah and that's what i was thinking or like, that you can feed something that already exists in some form but make it stronger yeah and that's what i was thinking about with like yeah. what i've been hearing in the house is just it's like is it me doing it are you or is it, it there Ah, is it just your imagination? Are I know. you feeding something that is there? Yeah, there's so many different possibilities. Yeah, yeah. That was a good. That was. I really like that story. Yeah, just uh, a little bit different, mm -hmm. and and the whole hidden thing, like the how, how could they not know where this reservation was on this route that she had? I believe it was she. I'm trying to remember the name now. It's uh, K. K. Okay, so yeah, he, she, whatever. Um, they had you know been on this route many times before, and then to not be able to find this thing again, especially in the era of. Google Maps and right. it's so easy to look and know where a reservation is or not. I know when she says like, and then our phones lit up telling us that like we'd missed the churn. It's like, yeah, that is, that's exactly what happens. Rerouting. Yep. Yep. So yeah, and very. They, they slip into some little parallel uh, place. Well, keeping that in mind. Yeah. And sticking with our driving theories of like, or like driving stories and the theory of like, can you get lost in time? How do you yeah. ever find these places again? Um, when I was prepping the first story, I had found it in the, you know, selection of or options to select from. I was like, oh, wait, I remember reading this story and I had flagged it like looking for a good companion piece. So I think these two go really well together. And if nothing else, I just think that like when y'all get in your cars, you're going to just feel a little bit twitchy at night in the coming weeks. Okay. I know I am. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Bum, bum, bum. Dear Lindsay and Dan, I want to start off by saying how much I enjoy your show. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm a huge horror fan and I'm always on the search for scary stories. Your podcast was recommended. Rent I can't speak. <laughs> your podcast was recommended by a friend who I knew would be into weird shit and now I'm addicted. <laughs> I think that's a compliment. Yeah. I grew up in a haunted house. It was the typical bump in the night, scary shadow figures and disembodied voices at night kind of haunted. Every time I've heard Lindsay say, get the fuck out, I just laugh because I seriously wanted to tell my dad that. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, my dad's mom, lived with us and she is one fearless woman. They grew up in Vietnam and took refuge towards the end of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Every time we would hear something not from this earth, my grandma would sit up straight and cuss the spirit out in Vietnamese. She would tell them they better stop it or else she would make their afterlife hell. I would laugh, but looking <laughs> back, she's probably what saved me. As I got older, I realized that I'm not as sensitive to these types of things, and I don't see or hear them as much as others. It takes a lot more than something thrown around the house or footsteps outside my door to scare me. So imagine my newfound fear when one summer night, driving down an old country road, I found something new. It was 2010, and I was attending university out in East Texas, a three-hour drive from my home in Dallas. I love driving at night due to zero traffic and I can blare my music and zone out. I've driven back and forth hundreds of times and I know the road like the back of my hand. On this particular night, I went to a friend's party in Dallas and had to drive back to my dorm before my next class. I figured if I could get a head start at 2 a.m., I'd be back on campus by 5 and then I'd take a three-hour nap before class started. If you're not familiar with Texas, the moment you leave the city limits, it's basically farmland. It gets more rural the further out you go. I was about one and a half hours away from the university when I really had to use the restroom. I cussed at myself for not going before and stopping at a gas station in the city. I knew I couldn't hold it until my destination and started scouting for a gas station. Back then, my dad had cheaped out and had gotten me an old model of a Tom GPS. Smartphones at the time were still too expensive for us to afford, and my flip phone could barely find service out there. Needless to say, Tom wasn't always 100% reliable. 
I was a big two. I was on a big two-way road since the major freeway had ended about 20 miles ago. Both sides of the road surrounded by fields and trees. I spotted a faded gas station and food sign up ahead and immediately took the exit. I didn't recognize the sign, but I was too desperate to get to the bathroom to care. The exit sign took me to a small street. I kept going, thinking I'd hit the gas station ahead. The road was pitch black, and I had to turn on my brights just to be able to see the dirt road in front of me. I looked around and saw nothing but empty space. I thought that that was particularly weird since there are tons of trees out in East Texas. About five or six minutes after getting off the freeway and driving down the small road, I couldn't find the gas station anywhere. What was even creepier was the fact that there wasn't anything around here. I'm not sure if it's because of how thick the darkness was around me, but I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I checked Tom and it showed a gray background and a dot to represent my car, but it couldn't pick up any streets or roads or landmarks. I checked my rearview mirror and I couldn't see the highway behind me any longer. I was only a handful of minutes off the freeway. I had been driving slowly due to how bumpy the road was. I knew I wasn't so far out from the main road. I should have still been able to see it. Starting to freak out a bit, I stopped and I turned the car around. Something inside of me was telling me I needed to get the fuck out of there. I slammed on my gas. I don't know exactly how it happened, but the next thing I know, the darkness just kind of lifted and I was able to see the road ahead of me and more was and more of what was surrounding me. There were broken down wooden posts along the side of the road that I knew hadn't been there before. And then up ahead was a broken down shed. It looked like something that came straight out of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> it was slanted, the door hung off its hinges, and was surrounded by tall grass. This is important to note because previously, I was surrounded only by a flat field. I had also been on a bumpy, rocky road before, but now I was somehow on a smooth dirt road. I hadn't made a single turn at any point. What the hell was happening? I kept going full speed, hoping to reach a major road, but there was nothing in front of me. No headlights, no road signs, nothing at all. I had timed my drive when I had taken the exit. It wasn't more than 10, maybe 12 minutes max before I had turned around. I had been driving back towards the road for six minutes, and still I couldn't see the main road. But I just kept going. I mean, what else could I do? Suddenly, that broken down shed somehow showed up again. How had it moved? I was hyperventilating as I drove past it. I hit the 10-minute mark of driving back towards the main road. This road seemed to never, ever end. I pushed my little Nissan to 100 miles per hour, going okay. further down the road. The shed now shows up just a bit further down the road in front of me. I slammed on my brakes now. The broken down shed is somehow closer to the road than before. Now it's only steps away from me. Now, I'm not a religious person at all, but I pray to every single god or deity known to mankind. I thought back to my grandmother and my mom. They had always told me, if I found myself in a predicament such as this, to not be scared. They taught me to yell out, like really, really loudly, to leave me the fuck alone. So I gathered all of my courage and yelled as loud as I could, leave me alone, you fucker. I'm not scared of you, and I'll fuck you up if I ever find you. And with that, I slammed on the gas and sped off as fast as I could. And like magic, the main road appeared in front of me. I was driving so fast, I actually almost T-boned somebody. I pulled over to the shoulder and was trying to calm down. The roads weren't empty at all. Cars were coming and going in both directions. And it wasn't pitch black anymore. There was plenty of light literally everywhere. I looked at the field expecting to see the dirt road and the creepy shed. Both were somehow gone. The field I had been driving next to didn't even have a road or a pathway to access it. There's no way I could have driven over the wooden post and barbed wires I now saw. Ahead, I saw a gas station that definitely wasn't there before, and I suddenly remembered how much pain my kidneys were in as I made mm -hmm. my way to the gas station. To this day, I have no idea what happened. I don't know how I ended up in that field or why my GPS malfunctioned like that. I felt like I was sucked into an alternative reality, and I hope I never experience that again. Needless to say, I don't drive at night anymore, not unless I absolutely have to. I hope you enjoyed this story. Drive safe out there. <laughs> Kim. Wow, Kim. Uh, yeah, another really uh, good story. I, I love both of those uh, this week. I know I love them paired together because mm -hmm. it's just like somehow it makes them both more, even more believable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that one felt like a dream, like a, oh. like a, like a nightmare. But if you're driving. Clearly not dreaming. <laughs> and, and yeah, you didn't get in a wreck. Uh, highly doubt that you were just just out cold, just <laughs> right. zipping down the road while you're dreaming. Um, and that one, I had a couple thoughts. Well, one just from early, just to get out of the way. I wondered, like, when she talked about, or Kim, I don't know, uh, he or she talked about, like, the um, 
their parents from yes. Vietnam not being as scared about the things in the supposedly haunted house growing up. Yeah. Uh, and, and mentioned like came from like Vietnam, like or left Vietnam, like during the war. Yes. I, I was just thinking, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I bet you are way less scared of paranormal things if you have lived through a actual fucking war. Right. You've lived through the horrors of humanity. Right. Right. You've lived through in like Vietnam, that conflict yeah. over there, like, you know, Agent yeah. Orange being dropped around you and like villages, you know, like, like people being massacred by the Viet right. Cong, by our own forces. Like there was just so much craziness going on that, uh, some spooky voices in the attic, you're like, get out of here. That's exactly what I thought. I was like, there's no way you're ever scared of anything ever again. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, stuff but, yeah you're scared yeah. Of, you're scared of another war yeah you know like they live into it but but as far as like ghosts and things that go day -to -day bump in the night stuff, like, you're like get out of here bullshit pull up a chair ghost yeah let's let me, hang out let me pour you a drink yeah. yeah we can chat um and then the the thing that really freaked me out in that story that i was picturing like cinematically in my brain yeah was that shed i know i'm like what was in the shed i kept thinking of the movie seven to like what's in the box <laughs> come on what's in the box i love that movie yep and now that made me think of like what's in the shed <laughs> Uh, and why did the shed keep moving? How it's like similar to the first story with the potential skinwalker or whatever that creature was. Mm -hmm. How is it that like you're driving down this road, a road that you've like an area that you've been to before, like, and it just it keeps popping up. It you, you're driving, it's there, then it's gone, then it's there. If you're driving, it's gone, it's there, it's gone. It's, I know like, the fuck. Yeah. I would think I was yeah. losing my mind. I would mm -hmm. be so terrified. Because me, I would think I was stuck in a loop. How am I ever getting out of this loop? This right, is it. I'm, right. I'm stuck here forever. I mean, thank God she turned around. Which, yeah, I totally. Mean, but then like Catch-22, when she turned around, that's when she saw the shed. I don't know. Yeah, but then, kept seeing the, but then she was going straight and the shed just kept showing up again. Yeah. Like, like as she was heading back to where she thought the main road was. Yeah, she's not like making and any shed, deviations. And, and the shed's getting closer to the roads. Yeah. You know, in some of those. But at some I mean, point, does something is, reach out? Yeah, that is so creepy. I am so curious, like, what would have happened if, you know, she would have actually, you know, if Kim would have walked into that shed? Oh, my like, God. Why would she get out of her car? That would just be preposterously stupid. Some nightmare is inside there. Uh, yes. Yes. I do enjoy that it feels as though yeah. once she sort of banished it, everything was okay. St still, still didn't go in the shed, though. No, but she what but, if he said, like, I'm, yeah, but, I'm not but, scared but, of you, you fuckers. But that's true. But everything kind of went away when. Yeah, uh, like if things came back to normal, that, yeah. she somehow miraculously made her way back to the main road. Like the timing. Right. Of, I do appreciate that she was watching the time as well to like, okay, there's no way I drove more than 10 ish minutes before yeah. I was like, this is not okay. This is not right. I turned around and now I'm six minutes back. I sh six minutes from a freeway, you should be able to see yeah. some sense of like other cars passing by. Like if you're on this road and the freeway's over here, you should see something. Right. That indicates yeah. other life. And that wasn't happening, wasn't happening until she banished it. And then poof, this like fog lifts and now she can. Yep. That's wild. And now there's no, <sighs> and then back on the main road, there's not even a side road anymore. Like a, I was thinking of like a service road. Yes. Yes. Like that just doesn't exist anymore. And oh, look, there's a gas station. Uh -huh. Like where was that? Uh -huh. 10 minutes ago, 20 yeah. minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, start our Annabelle's today or do you want Excuse me to? Excuse me. I just almost burped in everyone's ears. Mm -hmm. I can start. No, I'm happy to go first. Oh, okay. All right. We just have a little baby list this week. We're yeah. all caught up, which yeah. is so nice. I would like to thank the following Annabelle's for helping us to donate to Teach for America. Brittany Radovic, Cody Rourke, Courtney Hardwick, The Doobies, Alicia <laughs> Hill, Kathy Palmer, Ridge Burkett, and I have, I literally don't understand this one. Mike and Ian, RKO's Dave through tables. <laughs> I heard Tyler Like, say. do you know what that means? Hell yeah, what you mean? <laughs> RKO's, that's a, it's a, ref, it's a wrestling, uh, uh, basically like a wrestling movie. Like you RK, what does RKO stand for? Randy Orton. Isn't it? Yeah, you basically, it's like a wrestling move through a table. So oh. like that one guy RKO'd, like slammed Dave a dude through a table. Through a table. That was hard. Nice job. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I was like, I kept writing it out. Yeah. I'm like, for for a second, I thought it was like, was it supposed to be like Dave's like drive through? Like I was trying to make so much sense of this. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> we out here. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the wrestling. I think. Yeah, I forgot. Like, I didn't realize that Tyler was into wrestling too. I think I knew that Logan. Uh, was into wrestling at least at one point. They could mud wrestle at summer camp, you know. <laughs> oh my god! I'm gonna be honest; that's not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the following uh, Annabelle. Thanks for supporting us and uh, helping us with donations and everything else. Uh, Ace McNasty, Alexis Barnett, Daisy Leone, Ryan Gallagher, Joshua D. Gregg, Morgan 
a gag, Madison Overton, and Johnny. 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 That made me think of- uh, Here's Johnny? Terrible Johnny. Oh. Uh, the front man for uh, Highly Suspect. Oh. I follow him on Instagram. Of course you do. He's so- I love their music. He is so dramatic. He's like his posts. I'm just like, whoa, buddy. Like, like melodramatic. You, oh man. Big, big time drama queen. Okay. Yeah. Very, very entertaining. entertaining. Yep. Very entertaining. Okay. So, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I follow, I still, I still like the posts Yeah. and, uh, you know, wait for their next albums and stuff. But I'm like, oh, you, you love the drama, Johnny. Some people do. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I have a handful of spooky shout outs. If you don't mind. To Gomez from Monshare, happy birthday. So proud of how you have pushed through this year. To Matt from Joe, happy birthday to the best brother. To Dave from Tori, thank you for being my crazy weird friend. Love our talks. So thankful for you. To Andrea from Babs and Amari, happy birthday. You're the best mom. And to Jeffrey from Lisa, happy belated birthday. Aww. And see you in Cleveland. See you in Cleveland. Uh, and that's our show this week. Thanks for the ratings and reviews lately. They always help us find new listeners and they are always so appreciated. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. And thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C for their work on social media to Logan again, running bad magic merch.com. Thanks to Tyler C for producing, directing today, knowing the wrestling reference. <laughs> Uh, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed <laughs> creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. And thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding both of the stories I told this week. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to see the show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and pics from the episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. Also on TikTok at Scared to Death Podcast. For like show highlights on yep, TikTok. For show highlights. Super and, fun. And, you can, uh, and we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, if you want to meet some fellow horror lovers. And if you don't want to hear any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon and get the entire catalog ad free and more. Uh, hear your name on the show. Yes. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. It's a sneaky little witch teat. And stop saying teat. It's <laughs> such a weird word. It is. Kind of grosses me out. You got a couple teats. Stop. Oh, okay. I don't like it.